third sign. The people of innovation say, religious bigotry made us backward. Living this age necessitates giving up bigotry. Europe advanced when it abandoned it. Isn't this so? The answer, you are wrong and you have been deceived. Or else you are deceiving, for Europe is begotted in religion. Tell an ordinary Bulgar, or an English soldier, or a French Jacobin, where disturbing, or else you will be thrown into prison, and their bigotry will force them to reply, not prison, if you kill me even, I won't insult my religion and nation in that way. Also, history testifies that, whenever the people of Islam have adhered to their religion, they have advanced in relation to the strength of their adherence. And whenever they have become less firm in their religion, they have declined. Whereas, with Christianity, it is the opposite. This too arises from an essential difference. Also, Islam cannot be compared with other religions. If a Muslim abandons Islam and gives up his religion, he will not accept any other prophet. Indeed, he will not acknowledge Almighty God either, nor probably recognize anything sacred. He will have no conscience that will allow him moral and spiritual attainment, it will be corrupted. Therefore, in the view of Islam, in wartime, an unbeliever has the right to life. His life is protected according to Islam if he is outside the country and makes peace, or if he is inside the country and pays the head tax. But an apostate does not have the right to life. For his conscience is corrupted and he becomes like poison in the life of society. But a Christian may still contribute to society even if he is irreligious. He may accept some sacred matters and may believe in some of the prophets and may ascend to Almighty God in some respects. I wonder what advantage do these innovators, or more accurately deviants or heretics, find in this irreligion? If they are thinking of governments and public order, to govern ten irreligious anarchists who do not know God, and to repose their evils is much more difficult than governing a thousand people with religion. If they are thinking of progress, such irreligious people are an obstacle to progress, just as they are harmful for the administration and government. They destroy security and public order, which are the basis of progress and commerce. In truth, they are destructive due to the very way they have taken. The biggest fool in the world is one who expects progress, prosperity, and happiness from irreligious anarchists like them. One of those fools who occupied a high position said, We said Allah Allah and remained backward. Europe said guns and cannons and advanced. According to the rule, a fool should be answered with silence. The answer for such people is silence. But because behind certain fools there are inauspicious, clever people, we say this. O oh, you wretches, this world is a guest house. Every day 30,000 witnesses put their signature with their corpses to the decree, death is a reality and they testify to it. Can you kill death? Can you contradict those witnesses? Since you can't, death makes people say, Allah, Allah. Which of your guns and cannons can illuminate the everlasting darkness confronting someone in the throes of death in place of Allah, Allah, and transform his absolute despair into absolute hope? Since there is death and we shall enter the grave, and this life departs and an eternal life comes, if guns and cannons are said once, Allah, Allah, should be said a thousand times. And if it is in Allah's way, the gun also says Allah and the cannon booms Allahu Akbar. 
It breaks the fast with Allah and starts it. Fourth sign. The destructive innovators are of two kinds. The first kind say as though on account of religion and out of loyalty to Islam, as though to strengthen religion with nationalism, we want to plant the luminous tree of religion, which has grown weak in the earth of nationalism in order to strengthen it. They appear to be supporting religion. The second sort say in the name of the nation and on account of nationalism, in order to strengthen racialism, say, we want to graft Islam onto the nation, thus creating innovations. To the first sort, we say, O unhappy, corrupt scholars of religion who confirm the saying loyal fools, or ecstatic, unthinking, ignorant Sufis, the Tuba tree of Islam whose roots are founded in the reality of the universe and whose branches spread through the troughs of the universe, cannot be planted in the earth of imaginary, temporary, partial, particular, negative, indeed baseless, rancorous, tyrannical, and dark racialism. To try to do so is to attempt something foolish, destructive, and innovative. To the second sort of nationalists, we say this, O oh, you drunken pseudo-patriots, perhaps the previous century could have been the age of nationalism. This century is not the age of racialism. Communism and socialism pervade everything, destroying the idea of racialism. The age of racialism is passing. Eternal, Permanent Islamic nationalism cannot be bound onto temporary unstable racialism and grafted onto it. And even if it were to be, it would corrupt the Islamic nation, but it would not reform racialist nationalism. Yes, there appears to be a pleasure and temporary strength in a temporary graft, but it is very temporary and the consequences are dangerous. Furthermore, it would open up a split in the Turkish people that could not be healed in all eternity. Then the nation's strength would be reduced to nothing, since one section would have broken the power of the other. If two mountains are placed in the two pans of some scales, a few pounds weight can move the two, raising one and lowering the other. The second question consists of two signs. The first is the fifth sign and is a very brief answer to an important question. Question. There are numerous authentic narrations about the appearance of the Mahdi at the end of time and his putting the world to rights which will have been corrupted. However, the present time is the time of the group or social collectivity, not of the individual. However, great a genius an individual person is, even a hundredfold genius, if he is not the representative of a group, and if he does not represent a group's collective personality, he will be defeated in the face of the collective personality of an opposing group. At this time, however, exalted the power of his sentient, how can he reform the world amid the widespread corruption of a human group such as that? If all the Mahdi's works are wondrous, it would be contrary to the divine wisdom and laws in the world. We want to understand the reality of this matter of the Mahdi. How can we? The answer, out of his perfect mercy, every time the Muslim community has been corrupted, Almighty God has sent a reformer, or a regenerator, or a wise grant of high standing, or a supreme spiritual pole, or a perfect guide, or blessed persons resembling a Mahdi as a mark of his protecting the Sharia of Islam until eternity, they have removed the corruption, reformed the nation, and preserved Muhammad's upon whom the blessings and peace religion. Since his custom has always been thus, certainly, at the time of greatest corruption at the end of time, he will send a luminous person as both the greatest interpreter of the law 
and the supreme renewer and ruler and Mehdi and God and spiritual Paul and that person will be from the prophets upon whom the blessings and peace family. Almighty God fills and empties the world between the heavens and the earth with clouds and in an instant steals the storms of the sea and in an hour in spring creates samples of the summer and in an hour in summer creates a winter storm. Such an all-powerful one of glory can also scatter the darkness covering the world of Islam by means of the Mahdi. He has promised this and certainly he will carry out his promise. If considered from the point of view of divine power, it is most easy. And if thought of from the point of view of causes and divine wisdom, it is again so reasonable and necessary that thinkers have asserted that even if it had not been narrated from the bringer of sure news, upon whom the blessings and peace, it still should be thus. And it will be. It is like this. All praise be to God, the prayer, O God, grant blessings to our Master Muhammad and to the family of our Master Muhammad, as you granted blessings to Ibrahim and to the family of Ibrahim in all the world, indeed, you are worthy of all praise, exalted, which is repeated by the Muslim community five times every day in all the obligatory prayers, has self-evidently been accepted. For, like the family of Ibrahim, upon whom be peace, the members of Muhammad's, upon whom be blessings and peace, family, stand as commanders at the heads of all blessed chains of spiritual authorities in the assemblies of all the regions of the world in all centuries. Not just one of them is Sayyid Ahmed al sunusi who commands millions of followers. Another is Sayyid Idris, who commands more than 100,000. Another Sayyid, Sayyid Yahya, commands hundreds of thousands of men and so on. Just as among the members of this tribe of Sayyids, there are numerous outward commanders, so too there are the champions of spiritual heroes like Sayyid Abdul Qadir Geylani, Sayyid Abul Hasan al Shazali, and Sayyid Ahmed Bedevi. They are so numerous that together they form a mighty army. If they took on physical form and with their solidarity were formed into a division, if they awakened the religion of Islam and bound it together in unity and established a sort of sacred nationhood, the army of no other nation could withstand them. Thus, that numerous, powerful army is the family of the Muhammad, upon whom be blessings and peace, the Mahdi's most select army. Yes, today, in the world there is no family distinguished by such high honor and elevated qualities and nobility in its descendants, in unbroken succession and well-documented genealogy, which is as powerful and important as the line of Sayyids of the family of the Prophet, upon whom be blessings and peace. Since early times it is they who have been at the heads of all the groups of the people of truth, and they who have been the renowned leaders of the people of perfection. Now it is a blessed line numbering millions. Vigilant and circumspect, their hearts full of belief and love of the Prophet, upon whom be blessings and peace, they are distinguished by the honor of their world-renowned lineage. Momentous events shall occur which will awaken and arouse that sacred force within the vast community. Certainly, the elevated order in that huge force will surge up and the Mahdi shall come to lead it, guiding it to the way of truth and reality. We await from the divine law and divine mercy that it should be such and its being such, like we await the coming of spring after winter and we are right to await it. The second sign that is the sixth sign. The Mahdi's luminous community will repair the destruction of the innovative regime of the secret society of the Sufyan and will restore the prophets upon whom the blessings and peace glorious sunnah. That is to say, 
the secret society of the Sufyan will try to destroy the Sharia of Muhammad, upon whom the blessings and peace, in the world of Islam with the intention of denying his messengership and will be killed and rooted by the miraculous immaterial sword of the Mahdi's community. Moreover, in the world of humanity, the secret society of the Dajjal will overturn civilization and subvert all mankind's sacred matters with the intention of denying the Godhead, a zealous, self-sacrificing community known as a Christian community but worthy of being called Muslim Christians, will work to unite the true religion of Jesus, upon whom be peace, with the reality of Islam and will kill and root that society of the Dajjal under the leadership of Jesus, upon whom be peace, thus saving humanity from atheism. This important mystery is very lengthy, since we have discussed it briefly in other places, here we make do with this indication. Seventh sign. That is the third question. They say, your former refutations and strivings in the way of Islam were not in your present style. Also, you do not defend Islam against Europe in the manner of the philosophers and thinkers. Why have you changed the style of the old Sayyid? Why do you not act in the same way as those who strive for the cause of Islam by non-physical means? The answer. The old Sayyid and certain thinkers in part accepted the principles of human and European philosophy and contested them with their own weapons. They accepted them to a degree. They submitted unshakably to some of their principles in the form of the physical sciences and therefore could not demonstrate the true worth of Islam. It was quite simply as though they were grafting Islam with the branches of philosophy, the roots of which they supposed to be very deep, as though strengthening it. But since this method produced few victories, and it reduced Islam's worth to a degree, I gave it up and I showed in fact that Islam's principles are so profound that the deepest principles of philosophy cannot reach them, indeed they remain superficial beside them. The 30th word, 24th letter and the 29th word have demonstrated this truth with proofs. In the former way, philosophy was supposed to be profound and the matters of Islam external it was supposed that by binding it with the branches of philosophy, Islam would be preserved and made to endure, as if the principles of philosophy could in any way reach the matters of Islam. Glory be unto you, we have no knowledge save that which you have taught us, indeed you are all knowing, all wise. And they shall say, Praise be to God, who has guided us to this felicity, Never could we have found guidance, had it not been for the guidance of God. Indeed, it was the truth that the prophets of our Sustainer brought to us. O God, grant blessings to our Master Muhammad and to the family of our Master Muhammad, as you granted blessings to our Master Ibrahim and to the family of Ibrahim in all the worlds. Indeed, you are worthy of all praise, exalted. The Eight Symbols, which is the Eighth Section. This treatise consists of eight symbols, that is, eight short treatises. The basis of these symbols is coincidence, which is an important principle of the science of Jifir, and a valuable key to the esoteric sciences and to some of the Quran's mysteries pertaining to the unseen. It has not been included here, since it is to be published in another collection.